Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from around the world. Welcome back to Creation Conversations. It's been a, a very busy couple of weeks for me, and I know I wasn't there last week, but uh, thank you for the rest of the team for covering all of that. It was uh, I was dressed up as a Roman soldier for most of last week, so uh, it was it was great fun. It was good good times. But we have the whole team here tonight, so uh, uh, let's just go around. And uh, how about we start off by just. Uh, Telling us a little bit about what you've been doing recently, a bit about uh, sort of uh, the ministry work, a little bit of an update, so on and so forth. So, um, uh, um, what should we start with? Uh, let's start with Diane. Well, how how are you, how are you doing? I'm well, thanks. Yes, I've um, I was actually away from uh, my my home in Canberra for uh, most of the week on, on a private visit and. Um, uh, you may have seen in the news there have been lots of floods on the east coast of Australia. I sort of got caught up in that. Um, I wasn't flooded out, but uh, the, it did make things difficult for people travelling. Um, and uh, Craig and I both got caught up with uh, some chaos at Sydney Airport. Um, mm-hmm. But either way, because we do a lot of things online... Um, we can keep up with a lot of our preparation and uh, for our newsletters and uh, our watching brief on the science uh, news. So uh, we've kept going with that, and we'll have a bit to share about with, uh, with about that later on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've um, been keeping an eye out, and I've, I've actually helped uh, contribute to the most uh, the next uh, creation news that comes out. So there's some really yes. exciting news in there, guys. So keep. Uh, Keep a watch out for that. That's due out, what, John, in about a week or so? Yeah. Yeah, good stuff, good stuff. Sam, what's your update? I hear that you've got a, a good update. Uh, yes, I've start, officially started a new job. Hey. Uh, you, can probably see, you can probably see behind me my uh, my work setup. Um, but, yes, I've started a new job. Uh, I'm working with tech, which is uh, brilliant for me because uh, – the uh, eagle-eyed and loyal viewers amongst you will, will know that I, I'm a big fan of tech and uh, and all that all that jazz. Uh, but it, yeah, it's working from home. I'm super happy. You know, it's, it's really really good. Good stuff. And you've been a big help to us as well with all the tech stuff. So that's really good. That's exciting stuff. John, what have you been up to? Okay, well it's been a pretty busy week here uh, today. My wife and I go to Gimpy where we have Jurassic Ark, and we'll be running a seminar this afternoon and preaching in one of the churches tomorrow. And on top of that, I've been getting ready for today. So let me sort of show you a fossil here. That's a fossil from Jurassic Rocks. And I have here one special high-grade butter container with something in it. And later on, we're actually going to do an experiment that you can watch. You'll be amazed at the results. So pretty busy week. Looking forward to the whole program. Good to see you all. Yeah, and uh, we've got uh, some different segments which we're going to be running through tonight in terms of what we're talking about. We're talking about some design stuff. We're talking about some recent trips. We're talking about coal and all sorts of exciting stuff tonight. But um, Craig, what have you been up to to recently? And I know you've also got a, a little presentation for us in a moment as well. But tell us, tell us how the ministry is going. How's the museum down in Tasmania? Yeah, that's been good. I've actually been up in New South Wales, as Diane mentioned, as well, and been caught up in the floods and everything up there. But it's our winter down here, so it's a lot quieter in the tourism sort of uh, field at present. Uh, but it's going along well. I've, uh, you know, announced officially to my staff that I'm uh, mm-hmm. resigning from, you know, from active management, uh, full-time management of the mm-hmm. business to, to move into the creation research team uh, full-time. And that was only just yesterday that I did that. And I've got a, a men's dinner to speak speak to in Sheffield, Sheffield, Tasmania, not the UK, in uh, August 19th. There's about 100 men typically go to that, so that should be a great start. And, uh, yeah, it was a few blessings in Sydney, uh, you know, sort of in disguise, I guess, because the floods uh, kept us there for an extra two days. We are sitting on the plane for half an hour and then told to get off and go and find some accommodation that night. So... Uh, ended up being two two extra days, and I could go and visit a few museums and drag wow. the kids with me. 
Yeah, good stuff. So actually, um, I believe some of this, uh, one of the museums you went around is uh, part of the presentation that you've got for us this evening, um, looking at a bit about design and stuff. So how about we pull that up now? How about we start with Craig and then we can kind of go around others. Bear in mind, everybody, keep your questions coming. Um, keep on sending them through. We've got multiple Q&A spots this evening. We've got a little different topic for each of us to talk about. I've got some fossils from our museum project. Diane's talking about design. We've got John talking about coal and fossils. So we've got a great varied program tonight. So keep your questions coming uh, and we'll have an extensive Q&A session after we've all finished, um, as well as in between as well. And of course, remember any questions we don't get to, we save them up for our entire special Q&A session, uh, which we're due one fairly soon, I should think. So um, keep the stuff coming, folks, uh, and keep the questions coming. Sam, how do they send questions in? So you can send in a question in the chat. You can pop a cue before it. That would be really helpful for me because it means I can see it. Um, but yeah, just keep questions coming all throughout the program. And remember, obviously, if we don't get to your question, we do save them and we will get to them at another uh, program. Uh, and I have questions saved from last week. Uh, so in case we have a, a dry on uh, on questions, we do have some backups. So it's all good. Mm -hmm. But I have to admit, I wasn't here last week, but I, I did uh, uh, very briefly tune in and have a look at some of the statistics yeah. afterwards. We had a, a great group it appeared um, last last week. We've had some of the most viewers uh, and our video has been one of the most viewed of all time. So thank you all very much. And thank you also for those who do like and share and invite your friends and family to come and actually watch it on a Friday evening or a Saturday morning or wherever you are around the planet, because this really is an international show, both where it goes out and who we have on it. So thank you all very much for that. All right, Craig, well, I'll pull your slides up just here. Um, if you bring them up in front of you on your screen and make sure they work, we should be good to go. Okay, thanks, Joe. Well, as I said, I was in Sydney uh, last week and that's actually where I filmed from or well, north of Sydney actually in a country town called Gloucester last week then I, tra I traveled down to Sydney to head home and was caught up in the floods and the pilot problems and the airport problems and so I got to stay an extra couple of days and uh, enjoyed a trip around Sydney and Sydney's very well known for this particular building the Opera House but what was it, um, you know, it was established after a, a competition for what? I wonder if people know. Uh, well, it was established after a competition for design. In fact, the guy that won the competition, Jorn Utzon, is now famous in Australia because of that design. It was built in 1959. It's made out of prefabricated concrete shells i guess you'd call them which is really interesting they're not real shells but they're, they're, they're obviously called design but real shells in this world are not regarded as designs they're random uh randomly cre well, created randomly uh, derived objects it, it seems in science here's a sydney opera house that we have on display in our museum there's actually two there i wonder if you can tell which one uh, had intelligence applied to it so the one on the right has got exactly the same pieces as the one on the left <laughs> now what's the difference is it time is the difference is it random chance that's the difference or is it intelligence and skill? That's the difference. Well, during our visit to Sydney, we went to the Australian Museum. And here we have a few of my kids standing in front of a, a giant T-Rex model. And uh, it was quite gruesome. It had all its uh, insides opened and, and all sorts of things like that. But have a close look at what was involved. There were 17 professionals in, involved, over 10,000 person hours, five and a half months, and all those materials there put together to make that model. And look closely at it. See on its shoulder there, there's a whole bunch of hair looking things, which is actually 
meant to be the start of feathers. Yes, the museum's telling us <laughs> that dinosaurs, in fact, including T-Rex, started to produce or evolve feathers. And this is the start of feathers. And this is incredible. It's, uh, shouldn't, we shouldn't be surprised because National Geographic were the ones that put this model together and that's what they want us to believe. There's lots of little kids running. In fact, it was packed because of the bad weather and it's school holidays here. It was packed with children and families all reading that dinosaurs have evolved over millions of years and that T-Rex and other dinosaurs were the first to evolve feathers. And there's some displays there with dinosaurs with feathers on them as well. Well, did T-Rex really evolve feathers? You might remember from our discussion last week, this quote from um, uh, Mo Moshek from the University of Indiana. He said, the first eye, the first wing, the first placenta. We, I think we could throw in the first feather there. How they emerge. Explaining these is the foundational motivation of evolutionary biology, and yet we still do not have a good answer. The classic idea of gradual change, one happy accident at a time, has so far fallen flat. Well, the, the Australian Museum doesn't think it's fallen flat. They're out there telling all these school children that feathers evolved on dinosaurs from dinosaur scales, presumably. I, I can't imagine anyone thinking that a modern day crocodile, given enough time, would eventually evolve feathers and start flying around the place. Here's something I think is a little bit more scientific, maybe a rule that we could one day establish in science, that complex organs cannot form gradually over time, and feathers are complex, but they need to be fully functional within one generation for an organism to either survive or perhaps under under an, an evolutionary understanding or to pass it on to their <clears throat> offspring as a selected advantage. So can feathers uh, fit into that as complex organs? Well, look what this was in the museum. In the bird section, there's a wing of, of, of a bird and it, it talks about how the arrangement of the feathers, not just the feather themselves, there's a whole bunch of feathers in a wing uh, that are required to help a bird fly and it's the, their arrangement as well as the actual design of the feathers that are essential for a bird to fly. Can this evolve gradually? Well, also at the museum in the foyer when you walk, first walk in, uh, it's nearly as complex as our Sydney Opera House Lego construction perhaps. Well, it was enormous really. Um, this is not a pixelated picture. That's actually a Lego dinosaur. It's been uh, put together and there was a whole exhibition on that by a guy called the Brick Man. And you had to pay extra to go into that. So I didn't, didn't do that, but um, you could see some of these in the foyer as well. It took a lot of intelligence, not only to put the bricks together, but even to build the bricks. It took a lot of intelligence takes a lot of intelligence to build those dinosaurs. And yet uh, they say that T-Rex has evolved and birds evolved. Uh, but look what they call it, the exhibition themselves. They call them brick creations. They can't get away from using that term. Uh, it's, it's quite incredible. And yet these dinosaurs, imagine that walking around um, there's my son there standing in front of a, a large dinosaur and those creatures are supposedly random chance um, developments rather than creations. Remember our Lego Opera House? Which one had intelligence applied to it? Indeed, the instructions for the Opera House is called Creator, and you need to be an expert, uh, apparently, to, to put it together. Intelligence and skill is the difference, not random chance. Look at a living cell. There's a microscope slide using cryo-electron microscopy 
of just part of a cell. It's incredibly complex. Does that look like random chance to you? Well, we also visited the Australian National Maritime Museum. I hadn't been there before, and it was actually very well put together. There's a, a big plesiosaur with my children standing in front of it. It was a great museum, had lots of good stuff in it. Um, but there was this sign there all about how reptiles evolve in the water, because it's a maritime museum, from land reptiles and all the things they need to survive in in water and they say here yeah, marine reptiles evolved from land-based reptiles they had to change to survive in a very different environment they had to be able to move through the water breathe find food avoid predators and reproduce without returning to land they changed see that word there gradually generation by generation well think about it is it really possible to evolve gradually all of those requirements for life and in the pictures there listed all of these things they needed to evolve gradually to survive in water they need to learn to swim they need to learn to stay the right way up in water they need to learn how to reproduce in water they need to learn how to avoid predators <clears throat> how to eat how to slip through the water how to deal with all the salt how to stay warm how to how to breathe in water and how not to sink or float. So all of these things, a creature that's evolving in the water has to have to survive, yet they say it's got to be gradual. How is this possible? It's ridiculous. Remember our new rule? I think this should be a new scientific rule. Complex organs or features or, or functions within a, an organism cannot form gradually over time. They need to be fully functional within one generation for that organism to survive. And I thought I'd just slip this photo in. This is a photo of the forest I work, worked in in Gloucester, a, a rainforest up there, just to show some of you in other parts of the world, some of the beautiful forests we've got here. And I look at that, I don't see gradual change over time, uh, evolving all of these things. I see magnificent design and beauty that we can enjoy and, um, and, and study and, and praise God for. So back over to you, Joseph. Great stuff. Very good. Um, yeah, fantastic, fantastic stuff there, Craig, and great evidence for design as well. In fact, I think in a, in a minute we're going to go over to Diane, who's going to talk a little bit more about design, but particularly uh, copying design. Uh, but before we go on to Diane, I just want to share uh, my ministry update and uh, a few fossils and things that we've got and some exciting things that we've been doing. So uh, here's where I've been the last uh, few days. In fact, it was on um, uh, Saturday morning, which we, we went to this place, which is one of the reasons why I wasn't here last week. Uh, it was a pretty full on week. It was a pretty exhausting week as well. And we'll run through some of the things that we did. Uh, it ended up, of course, with our car breaking down um, across the, on the other side of the country. So we had a rather interesting time trying to get back over to this part of the country. And uh, it took two days for the car to get shipped across. And we had to get our own vehicle and transportation and all this kind of stuff. So busy, busy times. Uh, but here is where I've been. Let's see if anybody can recognize it. John, I know you've been here before um I certainly have. it's a beautiful I think it's place. Hans Stanton, isn't it Hans Stanton, yeah absolutely beautiful place this is where i mean i grew up not too far from here i spent uh my childhood this was the, the family beach of choice and so i would go digging along these cliffs because you can just about see you've got three layers here you've got the brown layer at the bottom you've got the red layer in the middle and then you've got the white or the gray layer up the top uh, the bottom layer, the brown layer, is a sandstone called carstone. Uh, it's where we get our. It's derived from the same word called quernstone. And what's interesting is we uh, we had somebody um, from Scandinavia uh, that came on the field trip, and he was really interested because some of his words have the same root word in quernstone or millstone or so on and so forth. Uh, and then the top two layers are chalk or limestone, the red and the white chalk. And it's in those two layers where you can get some fabulous fossils from. 
You can get some other fossils from the cast stone, but they're not quite as abundant. But we were here in order to lead a field trip. I mean, it's just an absolutely beautiful, stunning place. The weather was pretty good. It wasn't gloriously hot and sunny, but it didn't rain and it wasn't too windy. So that was great. Of course, when I arrived there on the field trip, I realized that my, you know, my megaphone, my bull, bull horn, it wasn't working or well, I couldn't get it to work anyway. So I had to resort to good old shouting. Um, so it did do my throat in a little bit, but it was a great time. We had a great group. We got to take them through the rocks, get them some critical thinking going on, and also they got to dig up and examine some pretty cool fossils as well. So a big part of what we do with creation research is it's not just, you know, presentations like stand up and give a lecture we actually want to present you real research that's why all the way through these creation conversations are oh, craig's been to go and look at some research and some evidence in a museum diane's going to be bringing us some evidence of stuff that's been published recently john's going to hold up all fossils i'm going to hold up fossils and we base it on real research that's been done but even better than that we like to take you out to the field and actually show you what's out there so field trips are a pretty important part of the work that we do at creation research we had a good crowd we had good fossils we looked at the fact that if you want to take the dates as literal then what you're actually looking at and by the way this isn't an equation that we came up with this is something that was pointed out by professor derek ager from swansea university years back if you try and calculate the rates of sedimentation he said the results are usually ludicrous and they really are because if you use the dates to calculate the rate of sedimentation at Hunstanton Cliffs, you get a rate of sedimentation of 0.002 millimetres per year. In other words, it would have taken 18,000 years just to bury one of the small fossils that we found on this field trip. Uh, and then that's when you begin to realise that there's no way that it could have been that slow, because time would have just destroyed your creature, right? You would never get a fossil. In fact, you would never actually get a chalk deposit because your rate of sedimentation has to be quicker than the erosional rate right it's got to lay down quicker than it can erode away and at 0.002 millimeters per year uh, it just simply wouldn't work um aside from the fact uh, over 90 percent of the fossils in Hunstanton cliffs show evidence of transportation in other words they've been swept in by currents so we need to really rethink the way that chalk and limestone actually forms so we had a great time they had some worksheets they had lots of fossils they got to do some critical thinking and had a load of fun and it was a, a really great day down at Hunstanton beach um this is what i've been doing as well uh for many many years now uh, at the royal norfolk show which is the largest agriculture two-day agricultural show in the country uh it's a huge huge event and it's been cancelled for the last three years and so uh, it was a huge huge event this year so for the last many many years sort of 30 odd years 40 odd years or so there's been a good newsstand at the royal norfolk show in order to try and give a christian presence at the stand uh, at the show uh, also associated with it is the norfolk postal bible school which uh, i'm a teacher for and i've been involved for many years i was a student and now i'm a teacher it's a great program so go and check that out but uh, what we do is we have you know invite people in tea coffee give them the gospel and we have games and activities for kids and it's a great way of being able to spread the gospel and evangelize to those and uh, i was there as the main attraction uh, as you can see all kitted up in my roman soldier kit uh, roman legionary kit but it actually gives you an important point part of the thing that we try and do with creation research is bring the bible to life show you that you can trust the bible and also put it in historical context not just in history and archaeology but also about where it fits in with the science genesis and everything else as well and so we have this costume which came from a retired uh, guy who did reenacting um which i i mean the whole kit weighs about 15 to 20 kilos right and i <laughs> every day all day for two days so i was pretty exhausted with short sore shoulders at the end but it was great because you had people coming up wanting to know what was going on you got to interact with them take them through stuff and you know what are you dressed up like this for biblical time of jesus bring the bible to life armor of god because of course you have to remember that when we think of armor of god uh, as paul wrote about right um 
we often envisage the sort of John Banyan medieval knight, where, of course, this is the soldier, the armor kit of Paul, the Apostle Paul's day. It was the Romans, and it makes so much more sense when you view it in that kind of light. We also made the media. I think Sam pointed this out um, last time. I thought it was originally only out online, but it was actually in our print newspaper, uh, the Eastern Daily Press, which is the largest newspaper, local newspaper uh, for East Anglia. And uh, yeah, we make 15 quirky things you only get to see at the Royal Norfolk show. And I'm one of them. So there, there you go. You can come and see a cool quirky thing. But no sweet little Bible verse in there. Uh, we had the report come and say, oh, can we take a photo of you? I was like, sure, sure. My shield's over here. You want to get my shield in? Let me just stand here position with the Bible verse in the background, you know. So it worked out. It worked out really quite well. Uh, but it was great fun to do. And we had a great opportunity to speak to people, great opportunity to delve in and give the gospel to people, as well as encourage and strengthen and, uh, and share with people and serve people as well. All right, I'll just uh, finish up there. And uh, before we go on and uh, and do some of the fossils that I've got, why don't we go on and talk, talk to Diane? Because you've got some uh, some slideshows and some uh, videos as well, haven't you? Yes, yes, I have. Um, one of the things we do is just keep a watching brief on what gets published as, uh, as scientific news or scientific comment and uh, help people to understand... Um, what they're reading and to look at it from a biblical point of view, just as you're doing with the uh, the, the rocks and fossils out in Hunstanton and uh, various other pla places um, and uh, <clears throat> help people to sort out what's the story about um, how things were formed or how they were fossilized or whatever and what does the actual evidence show. Mm. And we started sending out um, a, a newsletter about uh, what we do at Creation Research and just putting in these little um, bits that we got from the scientific news back in 1999. Where can people sign up to the evidence news, by the way? Uh, if uh, Well, on our main website, if you just go to uh, our main website, creationresearch.net, and there is a button there called newsletters, and you can sign up for the um, the email one, which is free, uh, and that just comes out as an email every few weeks. Mm -hmm. And there's also a print newsletter, which is um, has lots of photos and lots of ministry updates. Um, now, in Australia, that is actually literally a printed newsletter, which we send out by post. We can't do that internationally. It's just too difficult um, mm -hmm. to send things out by post. But we do make uh, a PDF uh, copy available after it gets sent out so people can still see it. Yeah. Uh, but you have to sign up for that separately. And this week we've got a really fabulous issue because it's about some of the things that are going on in the UK. So it's got a big section on that. Um, and uh, Craig's got a bit about uh, um, what he's doing in it as well. So, um, <clears throat> And also what we've been doing up at Jurassic Ark, some of the really interesting experiments there. So fabulous yeah. issue. Sign up for that. Uh, Absolutely. And, yeah. yeah. And we will actually be producing because this uh, new uh, creation news is, is featured very heavily with UK stuff. We will be printing a few. So if you live in the UK and you'd like a print version, get in touch with us, send us an email or come along to one of our meetings. We're starting to get meetings uh, booked up or even better, book yourself a meeting with creation research. Uh, and uh, that would be that would be even better. So. All right, Diane, let's bring up your slides here and we'll uh, just take us through what we're talking about today. Yes, this relates to uh, the um, the email newsletter, uh, which, as I said, we started sending out in uh, 1999. And we do actually archive all of the little science reports uh, on a separate website called The Fact File. We'll, uh, we'll give you the details after that. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, this is um, a, a couple of examples uh, that were... Uh, send in to us from uh, p people send us links to various websites and uh, scientific news sites and someone came across this article about inventions that were quote unquote modeled after nature and it was on this website with the rather extraordinary name of mental floss uh, and uh, 10 modern inventions 
modeled after nature. And uh, oh, yes, that's interesting. Um, <clears throat> we often talk about that in creation research. We, we look at um, things that, uh, as uh, Craig pointed out, some of the things that have been <clears throat> inspired uh, by uh, the things that are in the natural world. And it was interesting, the, this uh, article started out, humans frequently adapt technology found in nature to create. Now, notice that word again, just like uh, Craig found there, can't get away from that word, to create our own inventions, a concept called biomimicry. And this is actually a versioning science over the 20 years or so that we've been sending out our newsletter. Um, there's more and more examples of biomimicry or, uh, <clears throat> and uh, we've written about uh, quite a few of them. But uh, the first two in this list of 10, and we won't go through all 10, we'll just look at the first two, are two that we wrote about in some of our first um, email newsletters. And uh, the first one was Velcro. Now, everyone, uh, we live with Velcro all the time these days. It's just everywhere. And, uh, of course, um, Velcro itself is actually a trademark, um, but the, the term is. Uh, but, of course, we all know, very familiar with the sort of hook and loop uh, fastening. And uh, it comes from two words, uh, French words, because it was developed by a Swiss engineer originally. Um, for uh, velvet, uh, velour, and hook, which is crochet. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I, I do a, a bit of craft uh, work, and I, I do uh, crochet, and you have to use a hook to uh, actually do crochet. But anyway, um, Velcro was inspired by this uh, Swiss engineer who was out with his dogs, and he noticed that burrs uh, got attached to his dog fur, his dog's fur, and uh, that inspired him to develop uh, a, uh, a material that uh, would attach uh, as firmly as uh, burrs stick to dog furs. Now, I know some of you dog owners probably frustrated by that, but anyway, something did come, come good out of that. Uh, and uh, the particular plant um, he was uh, <clears throat> noticing was this one here. Now, do, we, do any of you recognize that? That's a, is it burdock? It's burdock, yes, that, that's burdock, right. Yes. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, and we have a drink been... over here called uh, dandelion and burdock. It's sort of a bit like the um, American's version of Dr. Pepper. And uh, it's traditionally, oh, right. made from, traditionally made from dandelion and, and this plant as well. Yes, yes. The, um, the, uh, before it dries out, it, it looks like this. Mm. And... Uh, but anyway, yes, it has these um, very distinctive uh, <clears throat> seed pods. And if you look closely at those, um, they have little hooks on their end. So if we just go uh, forward again. And uh, <clears throat> back in uh, <clears throat> just before we started sending out our uh, email news, we used to get a magazine called Science News, which is still published. Uh, and in an article, about um, burdock burrs uh, not getting stuck to dog fur but to, to bird feathers. Uh, a park ranger described these, these uh, seed pods as being nature's Velcro. Uh, <clears throat> and soon after that, um, somebody else wrote in, and uh, this was what they wrote in their letter to Science News. A National Park Service ranger quoted as saying that burdock burrs are, quote, unquote, nature's vel uh, Velcro, and he gives the uh, reference to it in the Science News article. As I understand, the invention of bur Velcro, the hooks on burrs, were exactly what led to the inventor into his final design. Now, notice that design. That cannot get away from that term, design. Um, <clears throat> right. It is just the opposite. Velcro is man-made burrs. And uh, that was actually a very good comment that we couldn't improve on. So we did actually quote that uh, in our newsletter. And uh, it's still there on our fact file. We've archived that. So back in uh, at the end of 1998 and in, in 1999, we started sending out our email newsletter. So uh, 
we're uh, way ahead of um, mental floss by by about 20 years. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, uh, their second one on their list was uh, self-cleaning paint. <clears throat> and here is what they said in 1999, the German building company Stowe released an outdoor paint called Lotus Sand. Now, does that remind you of something? Uh, right. When dried, the paint's micro texture mimics the surface of the lotus leaf to repel moisture and dirt from exteriors. Now, you may have heard of something called the lotus effect, and this is what it is. It's actually a surface micro texture that um, repels moisture and dirt from, uh, from exteriors, and in fact, it repels moisture. What it does, it's very, very uh, hydrophobic, right? Super hydrophobic. So it, um, it repels water, which means that the water actually forms droplets and then rolls off. And the inspiration for that came from this plant. And one of the things I like to do, um, uh, just like Craig, whenever I travel around, I always like to visit museums and also botanic gardens because we're very interested in, uh, in unusual plants and uh, interesting features of plants because there are some wonderful examples of design from, uh, from the plant world and particularly in botanic gardens where they tend to have more unusual plants. And so this is uh, from a visit to Kew Gardens, actually. They have uh, lotus plants growing there. <clears throat> They're more of a tropical plant, so they are actually indoor, indoors in, a, in the tropical glass house. And I, I'd encourage you to go there. It's a wonderful glass house and has some brilliant examples of, of the most wonderful design. Uh, but anyway, they have um, lotus plants there which have a water lily-like flower and they also have these very distinctive seed pods which are interesting in themselves. Maybe one day we'll talk about those because that's another example of, uh, of biomimicry that, that, that we can copy and learn from. But uh, the interesting thing here is the leaves. Now, if you look at the uh, leaf next to the uh, seed pod in the middle there, you'll see a few bright spots there. Those are actually water droplets. And if you look very closely at, at a lotus leaf, See how the water droplets um, have all are all sort of standing up away from the surface. The surface repels water and causes it to uh, form these very distinctive uh, spheres. And then they just roll off the uh, leaf. And if there's any dust and dirt and, and debris on the leaves, it will take them with it. So that self-cleaning effect is actually called the lotus effect because it was first... Um, inspired by lotus leaves it does happen with other leaves as well and the reason it does this is because the leaves have this distinctive bumpy surface and you have to get those bumps exactly the right size and exactly the right distance apart uh, because there's another effect called the rose petal effect and maybe we can look at that at some at some other time uh, which also has bumps, but that actually causes the uh, the water to stick rather than to roll off. Uh, but this is what the uh, the German uh, scientists, the German material scientists, were able to copy, and with their uh, external paint was this bumpy texture, so that the water droplets would form and then roll off, and you've got a self cleaning surface. Now, if we go back to the article. Uh, in mental floss in that first paragraph, uh, they started out by saying humans frequently adapt technology found in nature to create our own inventions, a concept called biomimicry. And in their next sentence, they gave thanks to uh, the source of this inspiration. And what did they give thanks to? This is their next sentence. After all, sometimes the best tech is right in front of us thanks to millions of years of evolution. Now, as uh, Craig and um, Joseph have just pointed out, time does not create things, time destroys things or uh, just allows uh, processes to go on and destroy things like your fossils uh, <clears throat> will get destroyed if they're left lying around for thousands and millions of years. Uh, 
things fall to pieces if they're allowed to uh, just sit around for millions of years. You, time does not make things. So, in fact, when we see something that is inspired by the natural world, that is because intelligent engineers like um, the Swiss engineer who invented Velcro observed the natural world, then used his God-given intelligence, his God-given brain to apply that and come up creatively with something based on it. Ultimately, we should be worshipping or giving thanks because worship is, uh, um, <clears throat> is uh, it comes from an old word meaning worship, right? Acknowledging the worthiness of the one who uh, has done something. So we should be worshipping the creator who made heaven and earth and all that is in it, whether it's big, small, mundane and ordinary or big and spectacular. We should be worshipping the creator. So let's, uh, if we just finish there, Joseph, and come back to us. Sure, yep. We'll hide those slides. There we go. Great stuff. Great stuff. Thank you very much for that, Diane. Yeah, and it, it really does. Um, it really does show how much we can learn from what God has created, but also how much evidence there is out there for that for design. Right? Yes. Um, the fact that we're actually taking this and using it as an inspiration for our own designs right, is just evidence itself that you're dealing with a design in. The in the first place so no, that was uh, that was really really great um what i suggest then we've done a good, done a good good show so far and i've seen there's been plenty of questions come through so why don't we deal with a few questions now and then uh, i'll show you a, a few fossils and a few little things about our uh, from our museum collection before we hand over to john for uh, for his session and there'll be a, a number of uh, opportunities to ask questions throughout John's uh, program, so keep all the questions coming. But uh, Sam, where are we at with questions so far? Okie dokie. Uh, well, we've had a few uh, few questions. Um, one or two sort of uh, more sort of general questions. Uh, one or two have uh, some relatively well, the, the, they're more sort of focused on what we've been talking about. Um, George mm -hmm. Bond has asked the question kick us off here how did t-rex wipe their bum with those short arms <laughs> i thought was uh, <laughs> well to uh, not make this too excruciating let's go back to the biblical picture because obviously god had to solve this problem not just for t-rex but for adam and eve as well now the need to wipe your posterior is a degeneration you see even today if you eat the right balance of uh, vegetable materials you will find this is not a problem and you don't need toilet paper so hence god did not tell adam over there is a roll you must use this roll right and the same is true for my dogs uh, as well as uh, any animals i've ever dealt with they do not need this if they eat the right food so um, as much as george thinks this is a fun question it's a question that uh, uh, never would have existed for a healthy t-rex or a healthy Adam and Eve, or a healthy pig, dog, cat, or anything like that. Those uh, creatures also, live in the water. Um, it's not an issue for them either. They get an automatic Japanese flush. Hmm. It's also the same for things like brushing teeth as well. Hmm. Uh, in a good world, you don't owe or only have a good diet, which goes way in helping you not have tooth decay, but you also have only good bacteria that doesn't cause tooth decay in the first place. Right? So it's a mixture of both of those. Hmm. It's interesting. Um, this was a question that caught me out somewhat as we were live on radio in the UK, <laughs> which just sort of came out of nowhere about Adam and Eve and uh, wiping your posterior. So uh, it really does have that, that biblical application to it as well, which is uh, <laughs> It's fun as well as important because it goes back to that very good world, right? We live in a fallen world today, and so it can be sometimes hard to envisage or imagine or ask the right questions about a very good world, right? Even the most mundane things like how you go to the toilet is going to be completely different in a very good world. Well, we know one thing, Joe, for certain, uh, lotus leaves aren't very absorbent, so they certainly didn't use... Lotus leaves. <laughs> <laughs> That's what <laughs> 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 
Good stuff. How about how about one more question then, uh, Sam, before we move on to the next the next segment? Yeah, certainly. Um, we've got a question uh, again from George Bond. Um, uh, feathers need to be preened regularly to reset the delicate barbs. How did T Rex preen its feathers with those large teeth? Obviously, that's a ten-second question. Diane, you answer it. <laughs> yeah, yes, indeed. Well, in fact, uh, the uh, standard story about <laughs> dinosaurs turning into, uh, or dinosaur skin turning into feathers, is uh, um, <clears throat> that they started off as these sort of filaments. But if you have a look at those filaments, they look nothing like feathers whatsoever. So they didn't need to be preened. Um, it's uh, it's interesting. I, I my visit to the UK at the museum there, they have two dinosaurs which they have covered with sort of um, hairy stuff plus some um, r rudimentary feathers, and they just look so ridiculous. But they're just next to a display which is of uh, fossilized dinosaur skin, which is completely reptilian. It's just like a cro crocodile skin. Uh, so they give themselves away. Uh, mm -hmm. quite regularly but uh, but yes that's uh, <laughs> that's a, a serious question um there's more to feathers than than just the actual structure there's also the function that that craig showed in the wing there um there are variations in feathers and uh, and they have to be put together in the right place in in order to function in the wing <laughs> and uh and also um <clears throat> the the large teeth of t-rex well, uh, they um, that they weren't all of that oh, all that tough. Those large teeth. So uh, if there were feathers, they probably wouldn't have been bad at uh, at re uh, um, uh, resetting feathers. But uh, that's not what they did with them. Uh, they actually used them to uh, to eat plants in the re in the very good world, and they were, they would have been quite good at that at eating fruit and things like that as well. <laughs> Uh, can I suggest, this. Sam, that uh, because poor old rabi has got a few questions on races and so are some of the others, that when we come back after Joseph, we tackle that race issue first. And perhaps, Joe, it's an indication we should do a whole program on the origin I think of race. So, yes, we, um, yeah. in fact, the first ever live stream thing we put out ever on YouTube was uh, on races, but that was three years ago. So we're we're high tide, um, high time to do another one. So I think we should do that as a special. If I could just very, very briefly comment on one or two things about T Rex and feathers, you've got to bear in mind that the grand total of evidence for T Rex having feathers is still zilch. Right? We have found no T Rex fossil feathers or any T anything about the T Rex which indicates they had feathers. Now you will find that they try and combat this by saying things like, "Oh well, they were just these downy feathers," so they didn't need preening or there were these downy feathers as a sort of vestigial leftover from the earlier dinosaurs evolving into birds because you've got to keep pushing the evolution of dinosaurs into birds further and further back in time because the oldest birds in the fossil record exist at the same time as the dinosaurs so somewhere the dates don't add up uh, but uh, there's a very well-known paleontologist that uh, I've known personally and I've been along to his lectures and I noticed in one of his lectures every single large theropod dinosaur including the T-Rexes were covered in feathers and I asked him in, during the Q&A session I notice you use all of your graphics with these large theropod T-Rex dinosaurs covered in feathers uh, am I missing something because as far as I'm aware we haven't actually found any large theropod dinosaur feathers in the fossil record and he said quote unquote no we haven't found any feathers but we know that they must have had ha we know they must have had feathers because we know that the dinosaur theropod dinosaurs evolved into birds in other words they're purely assuming that they had feathers because of a preconceived belief which is actually not based on any evidence that these dinosaurs evolved into birds and a lot of people think ah we've found dinosaur feathers therefore we know dinosaurs evolved into birds now the idea came before that it was an idea put forward first by thomas huxley right darwin's bulldog that um the dinosaurs evolved into birds the idea came before any kind of evidence and uh, uh the assumption of dinosaur feathers is the main evidence that they 
have for your patients that are evolving into into birds. So it's really based on pure assumptions. There's no evidence for it in the slightest. So bear that in mind when you uh, when you're dealing with this kind of question. But let's show you a few fossils very quickly. And John, I'd like to bring you on to to comment on some of these um, new fossils from our museum collection that have just come in. Before we hand over to your program, which you're talking to us about coal, correct? That's correct. Good stuff. Well, I want to show you a rather beautiful fossil. Sam, if you can put me up to full screen because I've uh, just picked this up. Let's hold this up to get it into the light and get it into fact. Look at that. They are absolutely beautiful. Stunning uh, fossil. Uh, and you can see all the iridescent sheen on it. This is actually from Russia here. Uh, beautiful fossil. It's a fossil ammonite, but it's an unusual shape. You can see it's a bit sort of ammonite up the top here. You see the, the sort of the curly whirly, right? It's a little bit ammonite um, but it then branches out into this sort of long J shape. It looks a bit wrong. Now, what's interesting is these actually are known from different localities. You don't find these all throughout the fossil record like you do with ammonites. They're all found in specific locations around the world, and they're found en masse in those locations. So one of those locations is the Isle of Wight. I've collected these uncoiled ammonites uh, from the Isle of Wight. You get them from places like Russia. You occasionally get them in places like Morocco. But overall, they're quite rare, and they're always found together in one place. Uh, so there's some interesting clues as to what potentially could be going on here. We were discussing this just before the show. And uh, John, what kind of conclusion did we come to with regards to these fossils? Basically, I've got some of those in my collection as well, and my personal collection is that they are degenerate. There's been an instruction gene somewhere for keeping them nice and tight and, and, uh, and folded, and it's come unstuck. And that's the next step down, and it's viable, but not as viable as the nice round ammonite where you can float easily. I mean, these creatures basically lived in the water, and they floated uh, and they could adjust the pressure inside to rise up or down. Now, the whole structure of that would make such a, a lifestyle harder. So even if it developed before Noah's flood, it's not going to migrate around because it's nowhere near as efficient as the lovely rounded ammonites are. Mm. So we're definitely looking at a degeneration. These are not evolving into a different species. These are going downhill. It almost certainly didn't help them. And it's interesting that you find them in localities. It's almost as if there's like a, uh, you know, a, a, gr a group of uh, all related diseased, mu mu mutated, degenerated uh, ammonite creatures all swimming around together. So that's a, a great example. But Diane, if I can bring you on, because uh, what, even though this is a clearly a degenerate, uh, a mutation, a mutant, one of the things that ammonites tell us is that, well, created after their kind, there's been no evolution, correct? Yes, yes, that's right. You can still see that that's definitely an ammonite. Um, it's just something has gone wrong in the grow control genes and uh, so that it hasn't formed its nice circular shape. So it's not going to be as efficient as mo in moving about in the water. So um, if you have uh, <clears throat> a number of these and they've reproduced with that same growth defect, they would have all stayed in the same locality. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it, it all fits with the um, big picture of the world as starting out very good, seeing clever design. There's brilliant design in ammonites. Um, but things are starting to come unglued as uh, as the world has degenerated and individual organisms have degenerated. And we're just starting to learn about all of the subtle things that go on with growth control. So yeah. it's something has um, gone wrong there. So again, good example of biblical history of the world. Good, good um, start, brilliant design, but affected by degeneration. Yeah. There's one thing I'll throw in there, Joseph, as well, and it's not necessarily popular to think about, but if you're an ordinary ammonite and you want a mate, then surprise, surprise, you will find that animals tend to prefer animals of their own kind, but those who are in the healthy bracket. So therefore, a mutant degenerate chihuahua may long to make love to a big great dame, but there's no biological uh, opportunity and so it, it chooses those which are smaller. Now, the same would be true for just about any group on the planet. And uh -huh. the degenerate ammonite, you will find its reproductive facilities in all of these 
are not going to match up with the healthy ones. So it will be forced uh, by its, its very construction to actually stay uh, with a group like itself. And as much as you might not like this, it's not discriminatory, it's a fact. One reason the pygmies live by themselves in Africa is the big guys chase them away and they could only therefore mate with each other. And you end up with isolated pygmy races, not because it's evolution, but it's the opposite. There's a problem with the pituitary gland, with the growth controls, and it eliminates the options uh, available to that group for mating. Yeah, no, good point. Um, okay, one last fossil before we move on to your segment, John. Uh, if you remember back to when I was in Australia with you in 2018, we were traveling sort of in separate vehicles uh, out in the outback, right, right on the way back to Alice Springs. And you stopped. I carried on because uh, we weren't in the same vehicle. But when you stopped, you found a rather interesting rock with a fossil in it. What was that fossil? Uh, you mean my uh, little um, stromatolite that was stromatolite, actually yeah. whole? Right. Mm -hmm. In other words, we, we had a, a beautiful fossil. Normally, you only see sections of these, which I believe you're going to show, but we could actually see the whole structure of the top. Yeah. Now, while you get yours out, I'll reach over for mine. I think it's behind me. So sure. you get yours out and talk to yours, and I'll show you some from here. Well, I've got my one here, so let me pull me up to full screen like that and hold up this one. Now, the one that John uh, got, I believe, was one of the uh, sort of Cambrian ones, so supposedly some of the oldest uh, ones on the planet. In fact, stromatolites are supposed to be the oldest living things on the planet in terms of the first kind of life that first ever evolved. You can see sliced up like this. It's quite nice because you can see if we uh, get it out of the glare of the, uh, of the light, you can see all of the layers running through it right now stromatolites are quite interesting because they are really algae which is producing rock as it lives and so they produce these layers and build up and up and up and up and up now john's one is from which i believe is the uh, is the is the cambrian but we'll get him to show you his and talk about his this one is cretaceous from south america right but we also have living ones today so it goes back to that after their kind so even if you want to believe that this one uh, is cretaceous so 100 uh, million years old if you want to believe that john's are 500 million years old it really makes no difference all you're proving is that for as long as stromatolites have been around they've been doing exactly what god told them to do which is reproduce after their own kind so john have you found uh, found your one there i certainly have but i've also made myself a problem i placed it on my computer and uh, my whole screen changed can you see that we can see that indeed, yes. That's yes, wonderful. Yes. Now, I've cleaned it up a bit since uh, you guys saw it last. Uh, can you see the top of the stromatolite? Mm -hmm. Now, that's incredibly rare in the fossil record. Normally, you only get to see the layers in the side. But this one had a tiny piece of that showing. And so I've cleaned it up since. And you can see tiny little uh, blobules there of the top of the stromatolite. So very rare uh, gain for our museum. And Joseph, you, if you can help me get this uh, choose what to share entire screen window cancel down the bottom. Yeah, off. you have um, you've you've just closed your your slide, so we'll need to bring your slides back up in a second. So if you just cancel, okay, that's good. it should bring you back to us. Uh, and what I think we'll there probably we do Perfect. is move on to your segment. So let's take you through getting your slides up. Um, okay. Well, we'll be before we do that. I'll show you a couple of coal things that people need to ponder that are governing that you get that. So, okay, we told you we had an experiment here. So I'm not going to be foolish like with this metal. I'm not going to put it down. Now, can you see the fern that's there? Now, at Jurassic Arc, we collect fossils. This is from Jurassic Rock just over the road, a part of the same deposit we're digging up, which also includes a coal section. Okay, we have a coal seam running right through the top of Jurassic Arc, and we know exactly where we are in the geologic column because they mine this coal seam just up the road at a place called Tyro. Now, what's interesting, of course, is that fossil there is in grey rock, and let me just put some acid on here, and if I can hold this up without ruining everything, because I don't want acid down my computer at all, can you actually see the bubbles? I can't tip it over yeah, too much. About, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just about, sorry, I didn't even think of that weakness in my whole situation there. 
I'm going to have to get this off or I'm going to ruin my computer again. But that's a, 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 a carbon, if a, a carbon rich fern embedded, buried in limestone, right? So therefore, we've got a coal seam, we've got fossil ferns, and the fossil ferns not in the coal seam are buried in limestone. Now, that's fact number one. Now, Joseph, you also have coal seams associated with limestone in your Carboniferous rocks, correct? Absolutely, we do. And we've got fossil mm -hmm. forms and all sorts from out there. We do, from the, from the actual coal seams. So that's interesting. Secondly, here's one from England. Now, can you see the shells? These are Australian shells. They're lingular, right? Now, lingulars are still here. They don't live in England anymore, but there's plenty of them fossilised are in, in association with the coal seams. In fact, in this bed, if you're looking for that coal seam, then you go looking for the layer of lingular shells just beneath it. Now, that was the first coal seam I ever explored in England. Uh, so fossil lingulars in the coal, under the coal, indication of where the coal is. In Australia, limestone. In England, limestone associated with coal. Okay, now see how good you are. This will uh, be a little, take a little bit time to actually get this orientated there. Let's go. Can you see the three little holes? See that, yeah. Just about see that? Can you see the three little holes at the tip of this fossil? Because I found this in New Zealand. Now, that's a fossil coconut. Now, as you know, New Zealand is not famous for coconuts. It may be famous for Maoris, but it's not famous for coconuts at all. So we have fossil coconuts in New Zealand where coconuts don't grow. Um, we have fossil lingulars in England. We have fossil limestone rich with things in England, but in Australia, we have the ferns fossilised in the limestone. Now, what we're going to be doing now is actually start to talk about this subject here, because one of the things we like to do at Creation Research is actually demonstrate to people what's actually in the rock and how to make copies of it in a really short time. Now, if you come to, yes, thank you, Jim, that may be the first fossilized coconut you've seen. It's the first one I ever saw as well. But they, they are there by the millions in the coal fields in New Zealand on the north end of the island. Okay, so when you have a look at this bit of coal, can you see the shiny bits? All right. You see some shine in there? Now, when you look at this coal from this side, most of it's fairly dull. Now, we're going to be trying to show you what happens with coal, how does it work, how long did it take, and can you make copies of the one thing that's a real headache when it comes to coal? Well, what is that? You listen carefully. Okay, Joe, remember this is Fossil John here talking. You're going to have to show me again how on earth right. I get bring, green bring up. Bring your PowerPoint slides up. Okay, I hit share screen, do I? Yeah, click share screen. Yeah. Go to window. Click. Yeah, click windows. Click your full screen presentation. Okay. And then click share. Yeah, done. All and right. There we are. No, you'll notice I've called so just a best. To, before you dive in, John, just to give people a bigger picture, your segment is in about, section, section rather, is in about three different segments, correct? Yeah, there's three different yeah. segments. They can ask questions anytime because most people don't go paddling around in coal mines like I do. Okay. And neither do people use coal much anymore. So their normal experience is very limited. Okay, I've got it listed under best evidences because I found it a really helpful thing to convince people just by what's in the rocks. Okay, there's Australia. Um, here's one of our coal seams that I did some research in many, many years ago. Now, it's our big brown coal mines at your lawn and Morewell. Lots of coal. In fact, we have coal seams that are 100 metres thick. I was explaining this to the Newcastle Coal Board and uh, they sort of looked at that and went, gulp. And then they said, now we know why we're going bankrupt. You've got hundreds of metres of coal in seams that are so thick. Okay, here's the story in one of your British museums. Peat, tropical swamps. Um, you actually form huge layers of plant debris. Then given much time, given much pressure, given much heat, you will even form black coal. See peat, the stuff in the swamps, lignite, brown coal, black coal after vast amounts of time. 
all right there's another version of it you have how coal was formed millions of years ago they can't help it dead plant matter fell into swampy waters then thick layers of brown coal peat and then you mine the the black coal the really good stuff okay there's another version changes in the rank of coal it's very thick as peat it's thinner as brown coal and under lots of heat and pressure it turns into bituminous black coal now this is what's sold to the students in high school in primary school on the abc on the bbc david attenborough's story this is national geographic this is university stuff okay now look at that coal seam now that's a decent thickness layer after layer of coal one of our big mines but here's what i was in the mine to research do you see that big tree stump now it's interesting you see i spent about a week in this mine before the mine geologist came and talked to me um i guess i was allowed in because i had friends in administration uh normally you have trouble if you're a known creationist getting into coal mines but let's tell you the results of this this coal seam is full of huge pine trees amazing and lots of slushy black stuff what's found in it brown pine norfolk island pine queensland cowrie hewan pine celery top pine now i'll be brutally blunt with you i live in australia i know all of those trees we've planted all of them at jurassic arc and there's one thing we know about them they don't like their feet getting wet at all did you catch that you won't find these growing in swamps even near the coast they'll grow high up out of the reach of the salt water or the swampy water they don't grow in swamps key point all right here's the bottom of the top coal seam a hundred meters of coal above us each a hard out british coal miners 100 meters of brown coal you see my ruler there for scale it's it's immediately on a clay layer now the interesting thing about this brown coal there's not much clay in it but there's beautiful clay between the layers and uh, we had a good conversation the, the the geologists and i you see there's a pine tree you're looking at a fossil pine tree just there there's the brown coal which is mostly brown muck uh, it burns you're not allowed to drive your vehicle through there unless it's got special exhaust suppressors so there's not a chance of the uh, of the seam gas catching fire did you catch what i said gas leaks out of this the powder the dust when it dries is totally flammable dangerous place but it sits straight on the clay and as i said to the guy i said tell me do we find any dirt in here that the that the plants would have grown in no i said well how did they get here and he basically didn't know the answer to that okay when you get close up you can see the cold bits of bark you can see the crushed up bits of debris that are brown pine and what you'll also find is it's got cowrie gum it's got pine gum in it so we know exactly what sort of trees they are what can you find in addition you find silky oak you find new zealand red beach you find silver beach casuarina i've seen them all okay anybody know anything about most of those trees craig i can ask you on the spot but i won't you see the top four the top three don't grow in swamps at all won't go anywhere near them the bottom two well i've got a swampy backyard at the moment and i've got both casuarina and banksia growing just up out of the wet soil um, not in the wet soil they'll they'll go up on the dry bits but they have a little bit of swamp tolerance now did you realize that if you find all of those trees mixed together then you have dry land trees non-swamp trees and a little bit of wet trees mixed environment not buried environment on the spot all of these things have been washed in how long have we known this i thought when i was in the coal mine i was finding something great no we've known this since 1927 and i, I know now why why i didn't get this reference in university because my professor at the end of the first week said we're not going to discuss any such rubbish as creation of noah's flood and he was adamant that coal formed slowly in a swamp now we've known that that couldn't have been possible at this coal mine since 1927 and it's been totally ignored 
Oricarians are not bog plants, and the only reasonable explanation of their presence in coal deposits is they're having been waterborne from some more or less distant site. Even when you have a look at our famous Newcastle coal seams, the first major expert on said these plants have all been washed in. Wow. Let's go to another place where you can find big coal seams that are brown coal. Now, if you've never been to Germany, you're not familiar with their brown coal seams, they have heaps of brown coal. Look at that. Can you see the layers in it, by the way? Get up a bit closer and you'll see it's full of tree stumps. What's unusual about these tree stumps? I mean, 1927, the conclusion was these were washed into brown coal in Australia. How about in Germany? Um, all right, so brown coal, Germany. It's got sequoias, California red ones. These are highland dry ground trees, not swamps, so we know what they are. And secondly, we also know that's how they show up. You notice that the roots are all busted. They're stacked one on top of the other at all angles. These trees were washed in, destroyed and washed in. Now, go one last example here in New Zealand. Now, I've always wanted to play with one of these machines, and I came across a farmer who owned a coal mine, and he was a Christian. And I said, can I enjoy this? So for the first time in my life, I got to really dig up coal. What was famous about this coal mine? A, it was brown coal. B, it didn't have much clay in it. C, you had to make sure your machines were fully suppressed so no sparks could get out because otherwise it, the gas would catch on fire. But the most interesting thing is the trees were so well preserved, he would sell them for furniture. Yeah, beautiful antique furniture on the spot. Magnificent. Uh, quite a deep hole as well. Can you see the brown coal? Can you see the, the shelves he's been using? Look, you get close up and you can see the trees. You notice something? Any of you who've walked up mountain streams know one thing. The angle of the rocks in the stream, the angle it's pointing down, tells you which way the water was flowing. You see, if the water in this one was flowing from left to right, and left side of your screen to the right side, it would flip over those logs that are all at an angle. This has been a stream bed. This has been a flood bed. Oh, if the water was coming from right to left, it would just aerodynamically flow over that piece of wood and leave it exactly where it was. So you find that in a mountain stream, the downward side always points upstream. Even the logs, the stumps have an angle to them. This is a mega flood deposit. I mean, look at that. Incredible. Did they tell you that at school, even about brown coal? Or did they tell you about peat bogs. Peat bogs? I'm sorry, but the Oricaria don't grow in peat bogs. Neither do the California redwood, which are found here in New Zealand. Amazing. Wow, look at some of the angles. The angles tell you how fast the water was going. So despite the professor, despite the theory, despite the so-called stories in museums, we know it simply can't be true in New Zealand. It can't be true in Germany. It can't be true in Australia. Back in 1927, the official view of the Geological Survey of New Zealand is that the coals are sedimentary of transport origin. What? 1927? That was their official view. We've had a lot of propaganda since then in the museums. Well, here's a modern catastrophic flood log deposit. We're in uh, the north of uh, the islands north of Australia. Um, see the house covered in logs? Um, there was a storm. The whole mountainside collapsed between the base of the mountain and the village, only a kilometre or so away, that the water moving rapidly had sorted everything. The soil fell out, the stones fell out, and finally you end up with these logs shipped into what's going to become a brown coal deposit. And you're right, there's no clay in it. Sooner or later, it will become an explosive area. How do we know that? Well, you see, brown coal is found in huge flood form deposits around the globe. But some of the other deposits of organic material that we've made, in fact, you can turn me back on now after they read this one, creationresearch.net, they can go to QA or fact file, search flood, arc, coal, etc. And you can turn me back on now, Joseph. Turn my well, screen on. Yeah, just remember, John, you need to press your Windows key and then click oh, on your right. browser 
and that'll bring you back to us so you can see okay, us. Okay, Windows key. Okay, that's on the browser. There we are. All right, you're back to us. Good, there we are. Now, I was saying some of our rapidly formed deposits also generate gas. And I came across the first place in the world this was sadly accidentally discovered because they'd made a dump. They dumped all the woody stuff, the other rubbish from the mill. They dumped paper. They dumped all sorts of organic material in Canada. And like they do out here, they'd formed a park over it. But this was before they'd learned to put pipes in it to let a certain amount of gas out of there because the guy with the, the mower was actually mowing the yard when the gas that was leaking through this dump actually caught fire. And up in the air went the mower about <laughs> two meters. Fortunately, it came down in the same place. But we discovered then from now on, you make a very quickly formed deposit, like a year to take up a filler dump, you make sure you put gas in a leakage place. Coal forms a gas methane. It burns. It burns. It leaks off coal seams. It's a dangerous explosive problem. Okay, now if anyone's got any questions, we can do it or we can pass on to the next section. I think there are plenty, plenty questions. The chat has uh, somewhat exploded. Um, I think not all of it is quite on topic, but that doesn't matter. Uh, Sam, are you around? You are there. Excellent. Um, I just, I, yeah, luckily, I'm wearing uh, wireless earphones so I can hear. Uh, I think it's hear everything time. right. Well, yeah. tell you what. What, one thing I have noticed, Sam, is we have had quite a nice number of donations come through. So why don't we just yes. run through them? Uh, you, you read my mind. Our thank yous You've before we do one, one or two questions uh, before John's second segment. Okie dokie. Right. Uh, speaking of okie dokie from Doki Doki, uh, we have four US buckaroos, a pair, character, etc. Italy stretching his arm forward to offer a cup of coffee. Imagine as you will with that <laughs> one. Coffee, yeah. <laughs> And another one from Doki Doki, two US buckaroos, another pair uh, it's, uh, with a waving hand saying, hey, you, while lowering the glasses. <laughs> there we go. Um, and Can't what stop. else? I'm just scrolling down to see. There was another one. Here we go. Another five US buckaroos from Doki Doki again. A Shiba dog saying, good job, while raising his thumbs up. There we go. Um, and we've also had another one from Doki. Doki's dropping the big box tonight. Well, thank you, oh. Doki Doki. Goodness me, MVP right over here. Five US buckaroos. A hippo character's head pops out of water, surrounded by his hippo squad. Uh, <laughs> or is, or is the, uh, the, uh, probably the urban uh, crowd in the UK would say his fam. Um, but, uh, right. <laughs> Three piece, yeah. uh, I am Matt, four US buckaroos, a pair character essentially stretching his arm for to offer a cup of coffee. And, um, and it looks like as well that, um, George Bond has been very kind and sent 20 Aussie buckaroos, five coffees for our CRT. Oh, <laughs> Look at Thank that. You. Lovely, jubbly, lovely, jubbly indeed. And that is, oh, Doki again, coming in just now with 199 US buckaroos, a red heart. Oh, thank you, Doki. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, right. Okay. Let's go into some questions. As promised, let's bring up Ravi's question. Yeah, let's do a couple of questions and then we'll uh, we'll go from there. Here we go. So question. How do you respond to Native American and Aboriginal tribes having oral histories that go back further than 6,000 years? These groups are not connected. Okay. As the one who's done several years of projects on the origin of races, and Sam, you might want to put up how they can get our streaming because we filmed this around the globe. So if you want to go and see the history of man, which is the first lecture I gave on this, and I remember giving it at Queensland University, and the place erupted in furor because the one point that we were making is that Aboriginal stories, Australian stories, biblical stories have an overlap beyond a shadow of a doubt. And when you threw in the controversial evidence, that the reason you recognize some of these words and these stories is the Aborigines came from India. So when you go to India, you can see dingoes and away you can go all the way back to the Middle East. So if you want to see that, go to History of Man, go to Origin Races, go to Real Roots, right? All of those are DVDs. The last two are documentaries. And we actually go around the globe interviewing the natives themselves, right? Now, these natives you will find if you start here in Australia, my experience, my background was simply this. I watched a documentary on flood stories. 
and it basically said the natives of the the South Pacific have none. And I thought, well, I'm I'm in Australia, and it said the Aborigines have one flood story. Now I actually went and I checked with the Aborigines, and almost every tribe has its own flood story. Some, such as Ayers Rock, finish with the people landing on the rock, and the big snake becomes the hero who rescues them. Others. Uh, end up being rescued in a big canoe uh, as the flood finishes you have rainbows in the story so there's no doubt about it uh, even Fraser back in the 1900s or sorry the late 1800s in his book The Golden Bow notes that these are actually correlative stories I've been to India you find those stories are there as well you mightn't like the names of the people the heroes the words the etc you come with me to hawaii you can climb the big island the mountain there and when you get up to about thirteen thousand feet yes it's good exercise you'll find pua lili no pua lili no now that was its name before the missionaries got there pua lili no is the cave of mrs noah the local story the big canoe landed on the top of this mountain and we were the first people that's what i find all around the planet now, the one thing you won't find from the Aborigines or most of these people in the Pacific is when did this happen? Because in Australia, despite the adamant of some of the questions that these are 12K plus stories, no, those dates don't come from Aborigines, they come from Europeans. So when I'm talking to Aborigines and I'm asking them when did this happen, it'll either be now or in the dream time. There is no... No, no calendar at all in their concept in terms of years or whatever. Now, it gets very frustrating to the Europeans because Europeans say it's 6 a.m., the program has to start or we'll lose business. To the Aborigines, we start when the people turn up. It's a very people-related culture that's got positives and our culture's got positives. The two clash head on by you can't get on trying to cross that cultural boundary, but there is no time. When you say, we've been here for 40,000 years, the land is ours. Nonsense. The white man says you've been here 40,000 years. Oh, sorry, that was last year. Now you've been here 70,000 years. Uh, no, sorry, those, those are white man figures. When you get to the tribes all around the planet, most of the tribes that I've visited have no... Um, no calendar base at all. You'll find some you can predict backwards using your interpretation of those Inca stones to say that must have been 12,000 years ago. But sorry, that doesn't come from the Incas themselves. Right? So you'll find this is awful difficult to actually get to. And the thing that's interesting is they all have a story of a big flood. They all have a story of a first man and a first woman and something that resembles the Garden of Eden. Now, don't take my word for it. I'll let Diane or Joe comment now on his experience. Go and get Origin of Races, Real Roots and History of Man. You will enjoy learning the things that have been left out of your textbook. Sam, how do they find them on on, uh, on our search engines? Uh, I have one. I have put that up on a link. Okay. I'll do it again for That's you. Uh, there we go. So one of the um, issues with purely oral based stories or traditions, uh, and uh, my wife is very much into her Celtic mythology, because there's a certain amount of Celtic mythology that you can use in order to interpret or understand culture, life how people live, this kind of stuff. The difficulty is trying to pinpoint when these events were supposed to have taken place, right? And it's the same with any oral history because oral history inherently is undateable, right? especially for a group of people or culture who don't have any dating methods in their philosophy or their understanding, right? Uh, and even when you do have dating methods, like you go to the Sumerians, <clears throat> Uh, and they had a, an early form of writing and a lot of it was oral, but they did have a form of being able to date things. What you'll find is that trying to interpret those dates and put them into dates that we understand is even harder. And the way that you interpret those dates every single time is based off the old Lyellian set of thinking. The present is the key to the past, right? Because his uniformitarian thinking didn't just affect geology, it also affected 
the way that we understand history, right? If you want a good example of this, just have a look at Egyptian chronology, right? It's a complete mess. And it's been a complete mess for a very, very long time because it's interpreted as a sequence of events when the reality is we've now discovered that different kings were reigning uh, at the same time of each other, you know, simultaneously. And there was it, your, your standard sort of thinking really doesn't work. So even when you have physical artifacts and physical evidence and a way of actually matching that history together, it's still an absolute nightmare. So it's even much more, it's far more harder if you're purely dealing with an oral tradition. Um, so John's absolutely right when he says that these oral traditions don't have dates. It's the interpretation, which is, as the Aborigines would say, white man's interpretation, right? It's a white man idea uh, to actually add these vast dates ages into these uh, stories and these traditions and these histories. So it's purely an interpretation based off of evolution, based off of how did these people spread around the planet, based off of the old out of Africa sort of thinking, right? Um, that's what you're really looking at. It's a evolutionary philosophy which is being applied to stories and not the other way around. Uh, it's a bit like the dinosaur feathers, right? You already have your preconceived beliefs there uh, and you manage to take what is out there and fit it into your preconceived beliefs and not the other way around. So be wary of that. Joseph, I'll just add in one more thing for Ravi's sake. He says the North American Indians claim a history of 12K years. We are not interested in what people claim because the political leaders here in Australia amongst the Aborigines say we've been here for 40,000 years. It's irrelevant what a person claims, even what I or Joseph claim, right? What's relevant is really the facts. Now, where would they get such a 12K figure from? It's almost like the guy who wrote one paper on the uh, glaciers of Mount Everest, etc., melting. Now, if you want to follow the current theories, the fear that the glacier is going to melt, and it's evidence for climate change, you find heaps of papers on that. You can say, but it's in 50 papers. But if you trace them all back, they go to that one professor in India. And is he right? Is he wrong? Well, you'll have to go and check. It may be a common claim in a thousand papers, but it's only based on one person. Now, in the case of the Native Americans, I've met them. I know where they say they came. I've asked them all up and down America and Canada. And I'll give you the Dakotas. We came from the land over beyond the sunrise. We sailed here, right? Now, then they have a story about a big flood. They have no chronology at all. When you actually look at the chronologies, you use the tree rings on the West Coast and you actually try and match it to carbon-14 and then you find one of the big dilemmas in carbon-14 is around about the twelve to 15,000 supposed tree ring layer. You have a whole missing group. And so it's not factual at all. It's a white man's opinion of how to interpret those layers that the political versions amongst the Americans are using for land rights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I caution you, Ravi, always check your source and where the source got it from. Because if you drag it back to one person, uh, you're in a dilemma. John, there was a, there was a, actually, I think probably on the fact file you'll find it, and Diane might be able to comment about it, but uh, there was a scientific uh, analysis of the rate of mutations in the Aboriginal genome, um, and the authors concluded that Aboriginals have been about for a, around 4,000 years, which would fit in perfectly with the biblical um, uh, time frames. So I don't know, Diane, if you, you know exactly that article or if it's on the fact file, but I remember reading it some time ago that, uh, you know, sort of shows that some, some actual scientific estimations uh, come close to what the biblical record is. Uh, <clears throat> yes, it was all part of a study of linking up um, where the different people groups came from. And uh, as we mentioned in the conversation here, the uh, Aborigines, um, originally came from India. That's been confirmed by genetic studies. The other interesting thing in parallel to that is also the um, genetic studies of the dingo. Uh, and there was uh, an estimation that the dingoes got here uh, 4,000 years ago, which was probably the same time as the Aboriginals as well. Uh, so the um, <clears throat> if you look in the fact file, just look up uh, Australian Aboriginals and uh, Oh, yes, there, there's a, a specific link to one of those articles there. Um, 
and uh, there, there are a couple of others related to genetic studies of Aboriginals and also of dingoes, and that will give you a bit of uh, what the, the, the real history of people coming to Australia is. Uh, are we back to the question now? Uh, yes, going back to the uh, oral histories, the, the Aborigines have lots of stories about origins, but they are not sort of embedded in, in our dating systems. Uh, most of those big, big numbers like 60,000 years and 40,000 years are related to um, European people uh, or people of European descent looking at archaeological sites and using various dating methods like thermoluminescence and things like that which which have their own um, which have their own problems so looking at actual buried artifacts rather mm -hmm. than from the, um, the the actual history as or, or the actual stories as told by the Aboriginals themselves mm -hmm. yeah Great stuff, great stuff. Good questions, good answers, guys. Good discussion. Um, let's move on, however, John, uh, and uh, and get your slides back up. So yep. remember, you just need to uh, hover over yep. your PowerPoint presentation, click on your full screen presentation. I'm putting that up on full screen for you now. So that yep. should be up and ready to go. All right. So we're ready to go now? I think so. Okay, it's not working. All right, it have you got the app? In... Yeah, no, I've got a picture to... in the main screen. Yeah, it what needs to be up to on full screen on yours, so you need to go to the uh, PowerPoint presentation, yeah, hover right. over it, it, click okay. on the big screen, and away you go. That's yeah, good. you're good. Well, All right, we, go. we are back in. Okay, uh, again, coal fields. Let me try and quickly go through the uh, coal fields and trees evidence and then move on to an experiment that deals with the one major problem in mining that kills people. Okay, we're going to start in Alaska. Yes, right out in the bush. Up there, you carry your M, you know, your Magnum and all these sort of things. Uh, it's wilderness country. You fly in, you fly out, you explore all of this stuff. Old coal mines way up north, freezing place, fossil trees, no roots, no branches. In the coal seams, fossil trees in Tennessee. That was the first one I ever saw. It's just on the border of Tennessee and Kentucky. Uh, notice why they're called polystrate. Poly means many. Strata, yep, they go through multiple strata. Now, when you have a look, these are the most famous ones, the ones I first flew deliberately to Nova Scotia to see. Uh, many layers, coal seam at the bottom. There's one I went back to see. These are famous. Uh, Charles Lyell and some of the early uh, people were very interested in seeing these. Oh, here's the ones that have been known about for ages, didn't have that name for a long time. Um, yellow hat, tree, notice the coal down the outside of the tree. No coal inside this tree, just on the outside. And clay in abundance. Oh, well, here's me in Australia with a polystrate tree. I took Joseph to see this one. But these are pine trees, the ones that don't grow in swamps, uh, the ones that the first explorers in Australia noticed and noted there was no pine leaves at the bottom of the tree. These didn't grow here. They washed in. Back to Alaska. Notice there's no branches, no roots. Now, I climbed up and down this. I couldn't get to this one, but you'll notice one thing. That's my long-distance camera, the best I had at the time. You'll have a tree with no branches and no roots. It didn't grow there. So the normal sort of story that they were buried slowly is rubbish. You'll also see on the outside the coal. The bark has turned to coal, but on the inside, it's petrified. Now, that's a tree. There's yours truly in his uh, Alaskan sort of warm gear, giving you an idea of some of the size of these trees. Look at that. We began to dig these trees out. No, not to take it home, but to show you some interesting things. No roots, even on the big ones. Look, prove it to you. I'm sorry for my uh, tea cosy hat, but they didn't have beanies big enough for us guys over here. It kept me warm regardless. So notice the trees are all broken. These are the results of trees coming from somewhere else on a huge scale. The bottoms are broken. Okay, there's clay here. There's coal here. There's trees here. And in the days when it was running, um, black coal and brown coal are found in huge flood form deposits around the gold, globe. And there's always a serious issue when you're mining. Like that, that, that dump we made in Canada, they give off methane. 
and they've got cautionary signs. The old keeping the, uh, you know, budgerigar in the mine was used for exactly that, detecting when the gas came out. Observe this New South Wales fossil polystrate tree. Yep, I took Joseph to see these. Pine trees, oricaria trees. Would you be allowed to ask, was this formed during Noah's flood? Now, I challenge any of you who are university students, why don't you ask your professor that question, see how he reacts? Because my professor uh, actually would have said, no, you can't do this. Make your next uni thesis on the value of Noah's flood and modern sedimentary deposits in earth history. Global deposits of coal. Yep, you can follow the Jurassic sediments around. They're pretty much a... 180 degrees of the Earth's surface. The Carboniferous ones are even bigger. That's the big coal deforming ones. And they're all leaking methane. Okay, what's the problem? There's the first problem you need to admit to, whether it's Ravi or George out there, scientific theories don't exist in absolute isolation. They're explanations about aspects of nature. And at present, the key rule is they are done without reference to God. You can refer to Lyell, you can refer to Darwin, you can refer to John Mackay, but you can't refer to God. Why not? There's the man who's the cause of it, Charles Lyell. Oh, he's really a bigger problem than Charles Darwin. He gave geologists and uniformitarianists and archaeologists that way of thinking. Whatever Carbon 14 is doing, it's always done. The present is the key to the past. But he had a hidden aim. My aim is to get rid of Moses out of science. Now, I bet they didn't teach you that in geology. You see, any answer is allowable of uh, why birds fly so well, except the fact that God created them on the fifth day. You've got to get rid of Moses. That means you've got to get rid of believing that God could make the universe and he did it without reference to time or place. He invented time. Okay, there's a key point for this issue. It's not the evidence that disagrees with the biblical record of creation and Noah's flood over the last 6,000 years. It's the opinions of men who willfully set out to reject and replace the word of God. Now, because we've just dealt with anthropology and, and legends in the Middle East, to confirm what I thought was happening, I went to one of the leading professors in Australia who was an expert in ancient Middle Eastern semantics and semitics. Okay, and I asked him, what about the dates you put on the Babylon, on some of these pyramids? And uh, I said, where do you get those dates from? And he said, well, actually, it's because in Babylon, there's the rising of the moon uh, at a particular part of the year. And he said, we work backwards from the present. And the only time that could have happened was several thousand years before the Bible would have existed. And I said, well, what happened if the world's axis was changed in Noah's flood? Which uh, is a tough question for someone who doesn't believe in Noah's flood. Well, I said, if the axis has ever moved, that would throw that date out completely. And Babylon would come a lot closer to the present. The opinions of men. And I asked him, could you fit the whole of biblical history into the data without doing that? He said, yes. He said, but we don't want to. You catch it? That's so important. Now, we mentioned before, go to our Q&A or our fact file, search for flood, arc, coal, etc. I was going to give you a question, save them now, because this bit is the key. I've mentioned clay. I've mentioned coal. I've mentioned methane. Methane is explosive. Fossils. I've showed you some fossils in limestone. But that's not limestone. That's clay. You see, the best fossils are usually just below or just above the coal seam, that's the ones that are still whole. The ones in the coal are actually chewed up into black carboniferous carbon material. They're still there. You can see them under a microscope, but they don't look like that anymore. Clay, well, here's what I've discovered. If you set ferns on a block of clay, then it carbonizes. No, see, that's 2020. That's when we started that experiment, and that picture is taken within several months of the fern just sitting there. Notice one thing, here's where it started, there's where it finished. It didn't take a million years to carbonize. Now, we don't have time today, but I've gone through, I pulled the, the fern fossils out of the coal. Uh, they look exactly the same. We've set this on fire and it smells like coal. 
Uh, you might laugh at that, that we sent to world experts. What's the definitive test for coal? They said, when you set it on fire, it smells like coal. Nothing else actually has that odour. It happens also on the inside. I mean, there's two fern, uh, two plants, and the one was put as just sitting on the outside and then see that really black one? That we covered in coal, clay on the top and the bottom. Man, look at the difference. The carbonisation of the one that was on the inside is way ahead of the one on the outside. That's why we have a Jurassic Ark. And for those of you who are in Australia, we have uh, Jurassic Ark visits every few weeks. Why don't you sign up and come and join us? I'll be at Gympie today speaking at a seminar. I'll be there tomorrow morning at the Church of Christ as well. Or, or come and join Craig and I when we have our official openings of the finally, you know, post-COVID museum in Tasmania at the start of September. Okay, now that's making coal and we can prove that's what we've done. But what about the stuff that comes off it? One plastic bag, one object inside it, put clay inside it. And some plants just carbonise, but some swell the bag. Do you notice what's happening? Gas is coming off and it's filling the bag, not in millions of years, not in hundreds of years. It's just coming off as you almost hold the bag. Or in this case, we used an organic source, which is providing gas. We used a mullet. Now, mullet is full of oil and we've been trying to make oil and make coal and make gas. Some things on clay just go straight to gas. Grass. Grass does that. Okay. Uh, by the way, we keep the records of dates and times and places. And if you want to see a smelly pile of plastic bags, then go and look at the mullet heap. And I tell you what, when you actually make bags of grass, they don't just turn into gas, they turn into heaps of gas. And we record all sorts of things like how much clay, how much water. There's 100 grams of clay, 200 mils of water, 20 grams. And look, after a week, it's already swelling. Well, how do we prove this is the same gas coming off in methane and not just smelly putrefaction? It can certainly blow your bags up. It can be dangerous. So here is our first test. We love to photograph everything. One bucket of water, because if the gas explodes, we need some water to keep the flames out. But because there's gas in the tin, we, it, we had to weigh it down. Yes, I know, high-tech equipment. It's amazing what you can achieve. One blue plastic bucket. Punch a hole in the lid and set the bubbles on fire. That's what was happening. The, the gas is coming out in bubbles, by the way. We couldn't get in our primitive equipment to come out any other way. But it certainly is interesting. You see the lighter at the bottom? You see the flume of gas coming off? Wow, we actually have made methane. And you know what was interesting? It was without any odour at all. No sulphur was being released. Sometimes you get sulphur in coal and it ruins the coal. But this had been made on pure clay and it was pure, non-smelly methane. And we even could set the bubbles on fire because it started to give off bubbles. Have you ever seen a burning bubble? Perhaps there's a new weapon there somewhere because the orange and red and yellow actually tell you the temperature is way up in the seven and eight hundreds. Quite remarkable. Oh, and look at the next, next bag. Well, it worked. We've made methane. We've made it for free. Glass crippings, a pile of clay and a plastic bag. Well, maybe not for free, maybe five cents for the plastic bag and the sealant. We've made methane and it explodes, or the actual explosive level of methane, uh, we, it, it, it only needs 4% oxygen in. Can you see now why when you have a coal mine and you strike a methane patch, you don't need much oxygen to actually blow yourself up? Pretty dangerous stuff. So therefore, we set a, a more, you know, any of you want to invest in something, this is one coming up great. We made our gas making machine. Yeah, what are we using? water, clay, and grass. And we're trying to get it to work properly and to work safely. That's one of the old fashioned gas storage units like they used to use in, in England and America, particularly during the war. Now, water is used as a safety basis. Well, there it is full of um, clay and, and, and grass. 
Oh, I won't explain how it works, but its job is to fill the one on the side. Look at the bubbles starting to come off. Fantastic. They're bubbles of methane. Okay, so there's the gas, the first gas we generated. Then we filled up the balloon and we put it in the, the tin and we set it on fire. We are making methane. Any of you out there who want to invest in this, we have a really green, simple, cheap room temperature. You don't need to heat this. You don't need to add any chemical editor, additives. This works really well. Uh, perhaps I could heat up Jurassic Arc with man-made grass clippings. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, that is Jurassic Arc. Beautiful scenery, isn't it? But you see, there's what's just happened. Last week, the EU Parliament declared fossil fuel to be green energy as climate change narrative collapses. Well, that's a fascinating statement. Um, you do know, by the way, that the world at the moment is running on coal and oil. No matter how green we try to be, we've just buried tons and tons of those big, uh, uh, you know, the wind generators, the, all the blades. We can't recycle them at the moment. Not very green. But when we first released our stuff on this gas, it drew opposition drew opposition from the greenies. I would have thought you can make it with no energy. You don't have to heat this up. No, they weren't interested because their real motive was evolution. Their real motive was we want to be in charge. We don't want to be able to say you don't need millions of years to make coal. Look, they can make it at Jurassic Arc in a few months. You don't need millions of years to make gas. It is, is recycling off because they make it at Jurassic Arc in two weeks. So any of you interested in investing, we've got trusts set up in England, in America. You can donate even tax deductively to that. And we are looking forward to, well, not saying told you so, but saying God even knew what would happen after the flood. And he's made a world where we could survive to the best if we exercise the one thing that's imperative and a part of creation, but not a part of evolution. In creation, we are given authority by God to exercise dominion over the planet, including over your grass clippings, including over your coal, including over your oil. So make sure you do that. Get in touch with us now. Uh, have a look at our Q&A. Go to our fact file. And now back to questions, Joe. Great stuff. Thanks for that, John. Um, yeah, I mean, we're usually supposed to be tying up in about 10 minutes, but we've still got a huge audience and we've still got plenty of questions coming through. So if any of the team needs to leave um, in 10 minutes time, then feel free to do so. But I think it'd be good if we can hang around for just a, a few minutes longer than normal and try and deal with some of these questions because the chat has absolutely exploded. Somewhere on here, they should give me a, a number of how many uh, comments we have in the chat, but I can't see them right now. But there we go. Okay, Joe, it's a lot. Don't, 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 forget my, don't forget my short term memory loss. You got to tell me how to get back. Uh, right. It's fine. Remember, you're pressing your uh, Windows key and then just clicking on your browser and that brings you back to us. Or you can just stop sharing or you can there we are. Do any of that. I'm back to you. That all works. Good stuff. Right. Yeah, we've had a. Uh, uh, we've also had some more donations through. So, Sam, why don't we deal with some donations first? And then we'll yes, see if indeed. we can some more questions. Certainly can. Okay. So, from Neil, we have 10 British buckaroos. Thank you so much, Neil. Very, Thank very, you. very much appreciated. Uh, and if I'm scrolling down, there's another one, I believe. Uh, here we go from Brother Timothy. Uh, 10 US buckaroos. Uh, Jesus is the only way. So thankful for you guys. Now we're yeah. thankful for you for tuning in. This is why we do it. So thank you so much for your donation. It's very, very kind of you. And uh, Keith, good old Keith, five US buckaroos. Fantastic. Uh, no, sorry, fascinating info as usual. God bless. And uh, just checking to see if there's anything else. Any other? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, here we go. Doki has sent us. Uh, 149 US buckaroos, uh, a sparkling diamond. There we go. Uh, Thank you all very, very much. We do appreciate it. And it does mean that we can continue to do not only these broadcasts, but also the rest of the work that we have going on around the UK and Australia and the USA and around the world. So um, just uh, keep tuning in. We've got big changes coming up and big news coming up for all sorts of places around the world. So keep tuning into that and keep uh, watching to see what happens next. But thank you all very, very much for your support. Um, just, on the, just on the back of that, Joe, I will plug again our newsletter, 
that is the mm -hmm. best place to keep up to date with everything creation research outside of our creation conversations. It's free to do so. Uh, just follow, follow the link um, there on screen and you should be able to find it. Or if you can't be bothered, then just type in creation research into uh, Google, uh, go to creationresearch.net, and then you can navigate to uh, sign up to our newsletters from mm -hmm. there. So there we go. Right. Question time. Um, this is where we sort of start to deviate a little bit, but uh, some related questions first. So show you are has asked, can regular ammonites unroll? Well, if I just uh, make a comment and the other guys jump in, you've got to remember these ammonites, the curly whirly ones, right? They're shells. They're like snail shells. They're like seashells. They're made out of calcite. They're very, very hard, right? So the shells will actually grow and develop as the animal grows. So on a standard ammonite, which I really should have one somewhere around here, but I don't think I do, the standard ammonite, the curly whirly one, right? You find them in the teeny, teeny, tiny, all the way up to the incredibly enormous and just like i mean the closest living thing we have to an ammonite today would be the modern day nautilus right but just like other seashells and things as they grow uh, all of these ridges are growth patterns so as they grow and they use the food and they use the stuff that they're digesting to turn it into calcium carbonate which is the shell and they build up the shell that curl will grow so when you get a fully formed ammonite right in its perfect form properly curly whirly, it wouldn't just be able to unroll or roll back up. What you're looking in the case of this creature is an ammonite that has had a mutation, which means it can't grow properly. So this is a fairly decent sized one. You get find them quite a lot smaller. You find them a little bit bigger than this. But you've got to remember the creature, let me see if I can get this up to full screen here. The creature would be living in this bit here, and he'd be living in there, sticking his tentacles out this way, right? So the creature would have to move along in this direction. And that's how you can see that really it's producing a lot more drag. It's going to be much harder to actually move, which is why we call this a degeneration, right? It's the creature going downwards. But the shell has actually formed this kind of J shape uh, as the creature has been growing and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It would have started up up here in a relatively normal shape, but even then you can see it's starting to get gaps and then all of a sudden as it grows out and it continues to grow round it continues getting these layers longer and longer and longer and it's uh, basically producing a more and more deformed uh, creature any comments john yeah i just uh, reached up behind me there's our regular ammonite right uh, yeah, ammonites, and Go ammonites and goniotites look fairly similar and they work on a similar principle but no because they're so hard they can't unroll themselves good stuff thanks for that all right sam next question next question uh okie dokie uh here we go uh this is one from doki doki uh when driving on the highway that runs through carved hills and mountains are there any signs that this landscape was originally deposited by a flood Okay, we're just about to set up at Jurassic Arc a uh, six metre long, uh, I think it's six metres long, uh, landscape former. So the kids can come and turn it on and then they can watch the landscape form. The difference between rivers, rain will have all, all of these effects and the kids can play with it and see what rain can do, see what rivers can do and see what floods can do. Now, you have to know what you're looking for before you can answer that question because the average person will go through the landscape and say, but look at all these nice gentle hills. There's no way that formed by a big flood. Well, the landscape they're looking at is the last part of the whole process because if you're driving through the Arizona desert, whatever, you can see a landscape with boot, but you know, the buttes or butts, whatever they call them over there and the layers within those go from one to the next to the next right over the whole state. Right. So, the underlying part of that landscape is flood deposited. The final uh, section of separate uh, landscapes is water running off the land. And then the more gentle ones is the present day type weather. And in the case of uh, Arizona, etc., the natives moved out of many of those canyons in the 1400s and 1500s because it's had perpetual drought almost since then. So climate change would be most welcome in Arizona and places like that. So can you see evidence of a flood? The answer is yes, if you know what you're looking for and you keep track of 
when you last saw this bed, right? So that when I went to Newcastle in in uh, in and uh, Alabama, I was looking for the evidence from its name that it was named by miners coming to Alabama, seeing the same thing. And then I've actually gone from Newcastle, Alabama, all the way out through Pennsylvania, all the way out through Nova Scotia, across St. John's and into England, then out through England and down along. Man, this is the same landscape. It may be covered in gentle forests today. It may be subject to ice in one part or uh, to tropical weather in the other part, but the underlying rocks are flood deposited. The superficial rocks is varied depending on what the weather has been since the flood onwards. Um, coming on to the convention uh, as a speaker one evening is Dr. John Matthews, um, who was one of the first people to sort of encourage me to get out and start doing digging and also put those fossils on display. So he was really one of the uh, forerunners who encouraged me in the Creation Research uh, Museum project or what it would become the Creation Research Museum project. Anyway, he's a retired oil geologist and uh, he's coming to the convention to give a talk on the evidence of Noah's flood really in the landforms around the Jurassic coast because you see there's a very clear distinction as to whether uh, a, a landscape has been carved out by water that is solid or water that is liquid right solid glaciers right very distinctive and when compared to landscapes carved out by water but of course you see some landscapes huge great big valleys which are either dry as in they've got no water left in them or they've got a tiny tiny little stream and of course the argument is over vast periods of time this tiny little stream has carved out a rather enormous valley um, and that's all that's left of it today however he's done some fantastic research in looking at how water performs and how water runs and how water carves out and actually matching that up on the much much bigger scale so you'll find we have enormous uh, what are called uh, uh, proto rivers so like enormous massive rivers from the past stuff like the proto thames which cut down through the uh, uk the proto solent which carved out the massive amount of chalk between the isle of wight and um uh, and the mainland, right? The Solent is the water that goes between the Isle of Wight and the mainland over near Portsmouth and the like. Uh, you've got another one which cuts down uh, across Norfolk and so on and so forth. So you've got these enormous evidences of massive amounts of water rushing down, and the evidence seems to indicate this was right at the end of Noah's flood. So if you come along to the convention, or if you can't, don't want to come to the whole convention, you can come along to the evening, get some evening tickets, and come along to the evening sessions and listen to Dr. John Matthews, who's got a great presentation on all of that as well brilliant stuff right okie dokie uh let's have a look at some other questions here um oh this one's just come in from neil uh he says uh question could you do a show on the mount st helens eruption and the effects it had on the landscape well, well john you've been to mount st helens there. haven't you yeah, I've been to Mount St. Helens. The answer is yes, we could. We'll throw in the other half of uh, the um, effects on the landscape too. They work well together. So flood yeah. deposition, Mount St. Helens, coal even. We can do that in one separate uh, show, Joe. That will tell, work you, well. um, tell you who'd be good to get on if we can, if we can arrange it, John. I'm not sure how, um, uh, how it would work technologically wise but it would be great to have bob powell on because he's done a lot of he did a lot of the original work at mount st helens uh back when he was uh, involved in geology there so uh, it'd be he's one of our uh, usa team uh geology background so i think that's uh, that's good i think yeah we should definitely we should definitely try and get him on but definitely do mount st helens i think that's good we've had a request by the way to deal with the ice age so we're going to deal with the ice age one session i definitely mm -hmm. think we should deal with uh, an extensive races uh, origin of the races edition um i think we should do the mount st helens i think we should do the flood formations and you know carving out the landscape so we've still got plenty 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 topics but do keep giving us ideas and inspiration and topics that you would like us to deal with as we go along as well all right uh, sam how are we doing with the questions uh we've got more questions but first from robroth baptist really looking forward to the convention that's always Great really stuff. good to hear good and stuff. also again doki come on you know who's <laughs> us here 
99 cents for uh, it's a dizzy face so i don't know what a dizzy face, <laughs> <would look laughs> dizzy like, face but... is. <laughs> probably something like that I don't, I don't know um right okay uh so here we go um uh this is come from doki i i'm not quite sure the what it means t-rex teeth on plot <laughs> could go either way in terms you of you might want to family. yeah let's let's move on from that doki if you can yeah. just get try and expand on that I mean, if you're asking did t-rex teeth eat plants could t-rex teeth cope with plants uh if you want to expand on that that'd be that'd be great mm -hmm. but um let's move on to another question okay uh this again comes from doki doki um there's been fast erosion on mars by water but why not on <laughs> earth according to science <laughs> actually we are uh we did write about um, the uh, research that's been going on on Mars quite a while ago. We haven't recently, but but yes, they're um, they're quite happy to find evidence of a big flood on Mars, but they don't or they don't want evidence of a big flood on Earth. Um, so we have uh, we have written a few things about the uh, research on Mars, um, probably about more than ten years ago, because they just keep on coming up with the same theories. We found evidence of water on Mars, and then a few months later, they'll say, no, we haven't found evidence of water. We found evidence of a carbon dioxide flow or, or something like that. Um, so we haven't done much about it recently, but you will find uh, references to Mars uh, on the fact file and uh, some of the earlier efforts. To, they're determined to find water on Mars. They're determined to find water anywhere else except on Earth because they want to find evidence of life outside earth because wherever there's water on earth we usually find life in it uh, even under antarctica and places like that um, and of course they're determined to find evidence of life in other places beyond earth because their their mindset is life just evolved from chemicals so that if we find uh, water which is essential for life in other places we might find life and therefore we'll have evidence for evolution well yes there's plenty of water in outer space and there's plenty of water in uh, other places uh, beyond earth but that's no evidence that there's any life there thanks for that diane um how are we doing with the questions sam we've probably got time for for, for one or two more depending on what they are and how deep yes, let's just deal certainly. with uh right okay so um Okay, so we've got one here from Bramble Matt. Just going back briefly to the uh, to the uh, the um, the origin of races, uh, it says when Noah's children emigrated to the harsh African subcontinent and away from the moderate Middle East, how long did it take for them to develop black skin and yellow eyes? Because I need to leave shortly, I will actually answer the first part of this, and Diane can take over from that. We've done a lot of work on races and skin colours and that together. Joe, you might want to throw in something at the end and relate to uh -huh. weapons or things like that. Uh -huh. Okay, well, number one, you will find a biblical perspective, and we make no apologies for saying that, that Noah's family got off the ark, right? They were on there for one year and uh, 10 days while the water was coming. They were on there for 365 days as the flood waters went down. Uh, they finally got off at 370 days. Uh, so you'll find that they were on the ark, nobody else is alive on the planet they own the lot right biggest real estate owners in the history of the world apart from adam and eve so you'll find that the colors of noah and his family are indicated by their names now as much as you and i find this strange in our current culture we still use it even if we use it as a slang so when we have someone who's got a red head we usually associate that with a bad temper here in Australia. No offence to redheads, but there's a big correlation between red hair and overexcitability, if you want to put it nicely like that. So they get into blues, which is the, the Aussie slang for having fights and that. So we call a redheaded person, six times out of ten, we'll call them bluey. Now, there's a name that's associated with a character or a personality or a colour of their hair. Now, Noah's children are named. Now, what's interesting is Noah's name has nothing to do with color. His name means rest. It's to do with the prophecy that was made over him, and he would bring his people rest. So you will find that in Noah's day, the boat was made. The people of God were all safe. They could rest from all of the trouble and the chaos after that. 
Now you will find that when you look at Noah's sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, Ham, there's no denying it, his Hebrew name is associated in a circle with the Egyptian word for dark skin, for black, etc. It's originally related to the heat of Africa. So when you find that Ham, you'll find he's always associated with the origin of black races. So you look at the Egyptians, the dark skin ones, even on their paintings are called Chemites or Hamites in our language, right? So dark Ham. Japheth is no doubt about it. He's a Hebrew word for fair. So Japheth is associated with the Greeks and, uh, you know, the, the Iapetic people who were essentially white skinned from then on. So jo, um, Ham's kids were already black before they parted ways at Babel and went to Africa. So they were already black on Noah's Ark. Black skin had begun before Noah's boat. What's it to do with? Dying can take that up. But the one thing I do need to actually correct here, black people don't have yellow eyes. Black people have brown eyes. Uh, you are probably referring to the uh, pigment uh, and the blood loosing that's gotten into the whites of their eyes. But Diane, you can comment on that as well. The presence of the skin colours on the planet, I know you won't like it, but look at my poor skin. I've got every skin colour on the planet on one body. I have brown, I have black, I have white. Uh, I even have grey in my hair now, right? I have every possible skin colour, red, all on the one body, and so does a black man. He's got white English feet. He's even got red in parts of his body. So you'll find that those skin colours, which Diane will talk about, do not deny the Bible being true. They point to the evidence that we've come from one family and we've lost our ability to control even colours. I'll go see you next week, guys. Uh, Craig and Diane, if you can read your phone messages and get in touch with me ASAP uh, with those PowerPoints. God bless. Good to see you. Yeah. Thank you, we'll be, you up very, uh, we'll be wrapping up very shortly anyway. But, Diane, can we just talk about this for a second? Because I think it's important yeah. that we need mm. to get away from this uh, idea that people develop black skin because they move to the very hot African subcontinent, right? Because uh, that doesn't always match up, really, does it? No, no, it doesn't actually. The color of skin um, is not caused by the environment uh, that you live in. Now, it may help you to survive in particular environments. Um, if you are very light uh, colored skin, you can survive in the northern latitudes where there's not much sunlight so that um, you, you still get uh, enough vitamin D during the summer months. You can store vitamin D over the winter. Um, that doesn't work uh, for very dark colored people uh, who might like to live in the northern latitudes and we know that because uh, dark colored people from Africa have moved to North America and Canada and they don't get enough vitamin D uh, or um, even in, uh, in England as well. Uh, the other way around, uh, dark colored people do survive well in places where there is lots of bright sunlight because bright sunlight um, can damage skin with ultraviolet rays. So the environment that you live in might help you survive if you already have an appropriate colored skin, but it won't give it to you. So the people who migrated into Africa and we have the biblical history that the descendants of Ham did go south from the Middle East into Africa and as John mentioned, um, they were already dark um, because we have that in the uh, in the name Ham, and we know that the biblical history we can follow where those uh, descendants of Ham went. It's all listed there in the uh, Table of Nations uh, that you might like to read. Uh, one of our colleagues, John Osgood, has done some very interesting research into uh, where those various descendants lived. And uh, he's written some interesting books. But going back to the environment, no, they were already dark when they moved into that environment and they were able to survive there because they had dark skin, so they were resistant to the, um, the, the effects of the of strong sunlight. So environment didn't cause that. They already were dark when they left there. Now, you have to remember at the Tower of Babel what happened the reason people did move out was because God split them up into a whole lot of subgroups by dividing their languages, by giving them new languages. 
So for quite a number of generations, you had small groups who were isolated from one another as they migrated out over the face of the earth and they would only breed with one another. So whatever characteristics were dominant within that group became firmly embedded. And so that's where you get um, distinctive uh, appearances of different, different ethnic groups. Uh, so that it wasn't the environment that changed them and it doesn't take long where, you, where you've got uh, inbreeding, as it were, to cement particular um, characteristics within, within a people group. So it's uh, not a long time at all. Uh, it was already there to start with and it just got reinforced by the fact that uh, you have all of these isolated groups uh, breeding amongst themselves. And this sort of idea of, oh, you know, people develop skin colour depending on their yeah. environment, it's really an old evolutionary idea because the yeah. old evolutionary idea stated that an animal, you know, Darwin's old idea stated that an animal would gain or lose certain characteristics depending on mm. whether it used them or what its environment dictated or so on and so forth, all of which has been proven to be nonsense uh, by modern genetics and, and, and genetic yeah. studies. So yeah. it's actually the whole idea of genetics and the way that we understand it and the way that we have seen the way that cultures have spread across the world and isolated themselves and you end up with this uh you know multiracial mm. group all back to Noah, all back to adam all originally created in the image of god all descended from adam but a isolated set of groups and the way that we understand mm. genetics and how genetics works fits in perfectly with that biblical picture of the tower of babel so it uh, it really does make sense we definitely need to um do a whole session on on on, on the origin of races and mm. uh, whether there is one race or many mm. races and the whole kind of concept and discussion around that i think that would be uh, would be very very important to do but we you know we're well over the two hour mark now so now is not the time mm. uh, so my suggestion will be to we've still got loads of people watching so thank you all very very much for staying here till the end but uh, i think it's about time that we start to wrap some things up now so um, mm. we'll be back again next week of course uh, and uh, have a whole brand new topic for you and discussion and so on and so forth thank you for all the questions i believe we've still got some more which we didn't get around to so we'll uh, we yeah. will deal with them in the future but uh, for now i think mm. it's time to say goodbye so any last words from anybody what are we all up to in the next few days i'm gonna have to take off because i've got family duties right now <laughs> we'll catch you later craig <laughs> yes well we'll see, see you later yes yes catch you later <laughs> we'll see you in a bit God bless yes, all. Good, goodbye and uh yeah. and do come back <laughs> yes yes absolutely mm.